Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture on the prospects for peace in South Asia to be delivered by Dr. Rafiq Dosani as part of the Center for Advanced Study uh, Initiative on Globalization. I'm Matt Rosenstein, the Associate Director of the Program in Arms Control, Disarmament, and International Security, or ACTUS, and I'm honored to introduce today's talk and our speaker. Now, the Center for Advanced Study Initiative on Globalization takes a look at how scholars, artists, writers, and policymakers have dealt with the issue of transnational connectedness in contemporary times. The Center for Advanced Study is not alone in, this, in undertaking this vast endeavor. Indeed, the number of co-sponsors who have signed on to this initiative attest to the interest across campus for what global culture looks like from a multifaceted perspective. Uh, the list is, of course, too long to read here, but the center would especially like to thank my own unit, ACTUS, as well as the program in South Asian, Middle East, South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies for additional support in bringing Dr. Dosani to our campus. The first lecture in the series was delivered in September 2002 by Walden Bellow, a sociologist and executive director of the Focus on the Global South uh, Institute based in Bangkok. Most recently, John Pfeffer, journalist and author of the book, North Korea, South Korea, U.S. Policy in the Korean Peninsula, gave a talk entitled, The Global Food Court, Fast Food, Slow Food, Imperial Food. Today, our attention turns to South Asia. Now, if one wanted to identify a region of the world where both the challenges and opportunities associated with the phenomenon of globalization are on display, South Asia would indeed serve as a compelling example. While several of the countries in the region are experiencing a gross domestic product growth rate of 5% or even higher, and India, for instance, is in the midst of an information technology boom, poverty continues to be rampant, and various human and economic development indicators are equally discouraging. The forces of globalization are also evident in political life and forms of government. Uh, for example, with the world's, what's often billed as the world's largest democracy, India, bordering a constitutional monarchy in Nepal and a uh, military dominated federal republic in Pakistan. The region boasts a diversity that can perhaps be matched by no other region in terms of its ethnic, cultural, linguistic, and religious diversity. <clears throat> and unfortunately, if one wants to speak of conflict, there are numerous, numerous examples to draw from in South Asia, ranging from the periodic uh, flare-ups of communal violence to state-level conflicts between nuclear-armed neighbors, India and Pakistan. In short, South Asia is a region characterized by complexities, and thus we've invited our speaker, Rafiq Dosani, to uh, spend an hour guiding us through at least some of these complexities. Dr. Dasani is a senior research scholar at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University, where he's responsible for developing and directing the South Asia Initiative. His research interests include South Asian security and financial, technology, and energy sector reform in India. And obviously, he's got a lot to talk about in that regards. He is currently undertaking projects on political reform, business process outsourcing, innovation and entrepreneurship and information technology in India, and security in the Indian subcontinent. His most recent books are Prospects for Peace in South Asia, co-edited with Henry Rowan, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2005, as well as Telecommunications Reform in India, which was published in 2002 by Greenwood Press. Dosani earlier worked for the Robert Fleming Investment Banking Group, first as CEO of its India operations, and later as head of its San Francisco operations. He has also been the chairman and CEO of a stockbroking firm on the over-the-counter exchange of India, the deputy editor of Business India Weekly, and a professor of finance at Penn State. He holds a BA in economics from St. Stephen's College in New Delhi, and an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. And finally, a PhD from just up the road in finance in, at Northwestern University. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Dosani, who again will address um, prospects for peace in South Asia. Thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you, Matt, and my thanks also to uh, the Center for Advanced Studies, its uh, director, Masumirie, and uh, the other centers that were kind enough to uh, invite me here. Um, so I'll, I'd like to spend some time talking about um, the prospects for peace in South Asia, and I'm glad to extend that to looking at the impact of uh, the recent vis visit by President Bush to, um, to India and to Pakistan just uh, last week. Uh, but let me start by saying that many of the questions about India-Pakistan relations remain to be answered. You know, analysts of these relations often find the trajectory quite puzzling. For example, you know, right now we know that relationships have improved. There's a bus service that connects uh, two parts of uh, the two disputed sections of Kashmir, a rail service is in the works. There are cultural contacts ranging from um, the cricket match to music concerts, uh, press visits, and subject to some dynamics in which uh, the US has also involved uh, a gas pipeline from uh, via Pakistan from Iran. Pakistan even says that it found the, um, the US-India nuclear su fuel supply deal uh, of acceptance to it, something that would have been unthinkable uh, even two years ago. So that's puzzling because how could such fundamental, apparently fundamental changes have happened um, in when through most of 2002, uh, the two countries appeared to be on the brink of uh, nuclear war. And at that time, analysts focused on a jihadist Pakistan faced by a newly resurgent uh, a nationalist Hindu party leading it, uh, the BJP, thereby invoking seemingly very fundamental and unchangeable uh, forces. And earlier, the 1999 conflict over Kargil uh, had upset a peace process that had begun with the Lahore Declaration earlier that year. So some conclusions are that it's the US-led uh, global war on terror that marks a turning point. Uh, and of course, the second aspect of this is uh, to, be, to lay the blame on pan-Islamism, and there Pakistan gets most of the, um, uh, the egg on its face. Uh, because to the extent that Hindutva exists, it has largely domestic overtones, whereas uh, Islamic counterpart has global overtones. So, but I intend to argue today that several forces are at work, of which these are just some of them, you know, the issue of terror, nationalism, and pan-Islamism, and that there are others which are more important, particularly federalism and economic growth. The framework that I plan to use for my presentation is that of strategic culture. This is a, a, a term often used in, in sort of the IR, con international relations or defense studies context, but I mean it to use that, to mean that a country's responses uh, to events change slowly, if at all, over time. You know, anything dramatic that happens from outside, such as say 9-11, either within or outside the country might influence the strategic culture, but only slowly and much less than the influence of previous strategic culture on this event. As an example, uh, the way, for example, that the U.S. responded uh, and developed its uh, global war on terror was influenced by its use, you know, its past use of global alliances with tested partners. The concept of a strategic partner versus a tactical partner, in the same way that today they're saying uh, India rather than Pakistan is the strategic partner, Pakistan is a tactical partner. Similarly, say Great Britain versus France. These are examples of uh, British strategic culture. Oh, American strategic culture, excuse me. So much less is known about Indian and Pakistani strategic culture. Uh, for example, does Indian democracy, sensitive as it must be to minority constituencies and border sensitivities, constrain or otherwise direct alliance building? Are there enduring national imperatives that transcend which party happens to be in power at the time? Do similar sit questions apply to Pakistan? To show the importance of this, uh, let me start with the statement uh, that India is the world's largest democracy. Uh, this statement catches the attention of US uh, foreign policy makers from time to time. And when it has done so, they have argued that India ought therefore to naturally want to be an ally of the United States. Thus, in the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration sought to incorporate India in the various alliances that it was creating as bulwarks against the Soviet Union, most notably the Baghdad Pact, which later on became CENTO. Uh, 
But this was rebuffed by the Indian Prime Minister Nehru, who preferred a non-aligned stance. In the early 1960s, at the height of the Cold War, the Kennedy administration actively courted Indian policymakers by offering aid and an active role in resolving the Kashmir dispute in return for collaboration against uh, China and the Soviet Union. Now, considering that Kennedy's intervention had saved India from uh, two disasters, once against famine and once at the time of the India-China war, US policymakers were upset when the Indians collected the aid, rejected any help on Kashmir, and avoided any thought of collaboration. Yet today, when the Bush and earlier the Clinton administrations have used the same logic you know, for democracy wanting naturally to ally uh, with the US, it resonates with India. Or consider the puzzling course of uh, US-Pakistan relations. Uh, despite being an eager participant in the various US alliances under Eisenhower and Kennedy, why did the, the US not help Pakistan save it from its uh, biggest disgrace in its independent history, which was dismemberment of the East into Bangladesh? Even while Pakistan was almost at the same time, or actually at the same time, helping the US build connections with China. Why did Pakistan assist the US in its Afghanistan initiatives to track down Osama bin Laden, despite overwhelming public opposition? And similarly, in, in the 19, post 1979 period, the Soviet invasion, why did the US Army turn to Pakistan when it sought to Af invade Afghanistan in 2002, rather than India, which was an equally willing partner? So to begin to understand uh, the strategic cultures of India and Pakistan, uh, I believe we must begin with uh, the beginnings of their modern history, which is independence in 1947. At that time, those who would become the rulers of India and Pakistan shared the hope that their countries would become great powers, each believing in, in the power of their common cultural history and the enterprise of their people. Instead, as we know, the next 50 years found both countries struggling with economic and social stagnation. The causes on each side were different. Uh, let me consider India first. India's rulers who came from the Congress party attributed uh, India's effective campaign for independence to the unity of their opposition to the British. Similarly, they felt that India's many castes, faiths, geographies and deep poverty, the crushing burden of British rule, uh, all these posed obstacles that could only be overcome by inculcating a feeling of national unity. In Prime Minister Nehru's view, only a united India could build the educational institutions, the roads, the electric, electric power plants, and the other public infrastructure that required the citizens to accept in the short term sacrifices such as high taxes and a large public administration. But Nehru believed that no common cultural bonds existed that could elicit such a unified response, at least none that he could identify and channel. As he asked, was there some hidden well of strength hidden in the people that could be used to revitalize India? Mahatma Gandhi believed it did exist, but it existed where this, as he put it, this cursed modern civilization had not reached, and that it was hard to communicate with this India. As Gandhi put it, those in whose name we speak we do not know, nor do they know us. It would, in a way, it's interesting, it'd be hard to find other rulers in comparable countries explain, you know, exclaiming such ignorance of their own people. But that's how it really was. And it should be noted that this was, of course, a far cry from the confident assertions of both the Hindu nationalists from Savarkar onwards, who spoke about the Indian state and Hindu nationalism as identifiable and identical. And later of Jinnah and the Muslim League, who asserted that Muslims too comprised a separate nation, a concept, interestingly, that Savarkar would have completely agreed with. Now, the method chosen by Nehru and his successors was centralized control of both the economics and the politics of India. The first was done through adopting a Soviet-style uh, model of state ownership of the means of production. And the latter was done by making local politicians dependent on the central control, on central control for their resources and through the regular use of constitutional provisions for central control that were intended for use only in emergencies. New Delhi even controlled civil society in India by regulating and limiting its organs, such as by becoming the chief patron of the arts, financing religious places, and helping to organize the unionization of labor. <clears throat> 
In that way, much of the initial flexibility that was gifted to India through the early adoption of a federalist constitution was lost for several decades due to the stultifying effects of centrism on both economic growth and political activity. The result was economic stagnation and political immaturity, which created regular crises that needed to be managed, especially at the time of elections. Um, I hope you can see this table. Uh, those who cannot should uh, put up their hands and then we have a few printed copies that may be given out uh, to people. Okay, um, uh, Liesl has them over there, okay. So this table shows the Congress and the BJP's vote share in national elections. I'll come to the BJP a little later, but you can see the Congress's vote share showing a steady decline in the 1960s. That's columns uh, sort of three, four, five, six. Three, four, five. Uh, this was a time when the opposition governments in, of the states were first established at the provincial level, and it required bold political steps, not always good for the country, such as bank nationalization, industry nationalization, the frequent dismissal of elected state governments in the, early, in the late 60s and early 70s in order to unify voters behind the Congress's message of national unity. And uh, in such a state, of course, religious parties had little space and were regularly accused of dividing the country. Now, of course, as we know that, um, well, let me summarize so far. So the nation building project, which was initiated by Nehru and continued by the Congress party up to his daughter Indira Gandhi's assassination in 1984, was premised on the danger of India breaking up from within due to its inherent problems. The Congress party, in essence, offered political stability, employment, and promises of long-term growth in welfare in return for the people accepting short-term sacrifices, such as high taxes, slow initial growth, the shortage of civil society, and centralized politics. The nation building project asked the people to accept a nationalism that was internal, and based on the idea that the political boundaries of India also defined the boundaries of the nation. That is, the flag and the nation were one. Now what broke this? The economic failure of the socialist experiment ultimately broke this social compact. Perhaps influenced by China's rapid break with economic stagnation after 1980 through going towards the market economy, uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, who took over in 1984, took the nation rightward with his liberalizations of industry. This, de this decisive break reduced the financial levers of central power over state governments, thus breaking the control of the center over state politics as well. This opened the space for both coalition politics and a re-emergence of civil society. Civil society found its, its resurgence most prominently in various sub-nationalisms, of which the Hindutva movement, following the IOT agitations in the late 1980s, and the Kashmiriyat movement following the rigged state elections of 1987 were the most prominent. Subsequently, the state would have to accommodate civil society of various kinds. Regionalism was one of those movements more easily accommodated in a democratic uh, federalized polity, except in Kashmir, where its ramic ramifications were transnational and therefore harder to control. I'm not going to spend much time on the Punjab agitation, which was part of the sub-nationalist movement, but it's a good example of how Centralism is very difficult as a strategy to handle these sorts of things. It was only in the later post-centralist era that a solution was possible. So one of the outcomes of economic decentralization was, uh, of the decentralization was visible in the 1989 elections that happened uh, after this move took place, when a change in government in New Delhi, that is at the center, ushered in an era of coalition governance that continues to this day. As part of this process, several regional parties, such as the Janta Dal Secular in Karnataka, the Telugu Desam in Andhra Pradesh, the Marxists in West Bengal, of course, who had come in earlier, the Samajwadi Party in Uttar Pradesh, these came to power at the state over a period of time and also began to play important national political roles, sometimes in opposition to the Congress, sometimes in alliance with it. Either way, the Congress Party realized that it could not rule alone. Whereas earlier all political party resided in New Delhi, the 1990s saw a devolution of power to the states. Of course, this was completely consistent with Indian democracy. The India's constitution is explicitly federal. It was just that the Congress party had spurned federalism until 1989 and then after that could no longer do so. Uh, 
And as power devolved to the states and the districts, it actually came into Congress congruence with uh, political reality. For example, agriculture, education, and health were always state subjects. They were the responsibility of the provincial government. But in the centralized era, that is up to 1989, these sectors stagnated owing to the lack of incentives and resources with the states. Now with power in local hands, dramatic initiatives and social development were possible and indeed have begun to be implemented. Examples are the digitization of rural government services, agricultural extension services, private tertiary education services, state highway construction. The macroeconomic results of that are not yet that noticeable, but I'll give you one example. A little noticed measure is the absence of crop failures. Till 1989, crop failures were a regular feature of the Indian environment. It was almost a truism that every five years you'd have two good years, you know, two sort of average years and one very bad year. And that cycle broke down post-1989. And if you look at the rainfall patterns, there has been some improvement in average rainfall, but if you look at the variation, which is really the reason for shortfalls, there has been no change. And that I attribute at least in part to uh, the federalized political structure that happened after 1989. The lower variation ag in agricultural growth, the greater percentage of services in the economy are other emerging evidences of the, the benefits of federalization. And finally, a word about the Hindutva movement before I turn to Pakistan. The rise of the movement uh, of the Hindutva movement or the movement for the politicization of the Hindu faith began in 1989 with the rise in coalition government. So the same forces that unleashed federalism did this one too. Even though it had existed earlier and there were tactical reasons such as Rajiv Gandhi's use of the RSS following Mrs. Gandhi's assassination that helped its revival. But its aims, unlike other subnationalist movements like the Khalistan Kashmir insurgencies, were national rather than local. Its political standard bearer is the BJP, a party formed after independence, after the dust from Mahatma Gandhi's assassination had settled. Uh, given the ability, inability to find political space in the Nehruvian and uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi's era, the BJP tried various strategies to legitimize itself. Uh, it even dabbled with socialism in the early 1980s. But then with 1989, it moved its religious roots front and center with the Ayodhya agitation. This helped it to, as you will see there in the 1989 elections, double its vote share from nearly double from 11 to 20 percent. Since then, the BJP has grown to become the national alternative to the Congress party. However, it's the stagnation of its vote at 20 percent in the next, that is the 1996 election, despite the Babri Masjid the demolition before that, as well as the stagnation even after the wildly popular nuclear tests, so the elections that followed that, in 1998, showed that uh, that sort of radical strategy was diminishing, had diminishing electoral returns. And so this then led it to a strategy of building an anti-Congress coalition that necessarily included several moderate parties and required it to change its radical stance at the center while pursuing a harder approach at the states where it did not need uh, coalitions. So the BJP should be credited, I think, with, uh, with creating or helping to create the environment of coalition governance in India, although I think the forces that caused it were far more fundamental and unchangeable. And of course, the question is whether the strategy of the BJPs is ultimately consistent, whether you can have you know, a hard uh, state and a soft center approach to stay in power. The BJP thought it could work after the, the state elections in Gujarat in 2002, uh, but then was removed from power in 2004. And uh, currently, I believe it's in the process sort of, of re-examining its roots, you know, what is it really? And it's going to be a very difficult task for that. While it does that, I think the, the issue of Hindutva is likely to remain quiet as a source of uh, national activity, but its trajectory over the next few years is, is uncertain. Let me now turn to Pakistan. In Pakistan, meanwhile, partition at the time of independence played havoc with politics because the leaders from the freedom movement, such as Jinnah and the first prime minister, Liaquat Ali Khan, came from what was now India. And they demanded the right to govern a country where the, where the local residents were not of the same, at least the same ethnicity, or they were not localized into the politics of that area. And so there was a huge battle in that sense between local and migrant politicians. 
And the first uh, victim of that was Pakistan's constitution, which was, uh, you know, battled over for nine years. So it was only in 1956 that uh, Pakistan was able to approve its first constitution. And by that time, the federal system that the constitution ultimately adopted was uh, pretty much reversed. You know, pro the, the governor general disbanded the constituent assembly in 1954. Later in 1958, he dismissed the elected government. Of course, three weeks later, he himself was dismissed in a coup by Ayub Khan. Since then, of course, the army has been the chronic uh, dominant political force in Pakistan. Subsequent civilian governments have been weak, short-lived, and often served at the army's sufferance. While in past, civilian government, perhaps because of its short leash, has not taken root and been easily controlled by uh, often corrupt feudal forces. As uh, Charles Kennedy writes in our book, um, and I'll just quote a paragraph from there, Constitutional government in Pakistan has been more sham than substance. Pakistan has had five constitutions in its brief history, one inherited at independence and four indigenous creations in 1956, 62, 72, and 73. It has been governed with, at times without the benefit of a written constitution, that is 58 to 62 and 1969 to 1971, under a suspended constitution, 1977 to 85, and under a modified though restored constitution, 1985 to 1997, the latter of which was wholly altered by the passage of the 13th Amendment, 1997 to 1999. At the core of these failures, as Kennedy notes, has been the chronic political dominance of Pakistan's military. During the 46 years since Pakistan's first military coup, civilian governments have been in control for only 22 years, and I pointed out mostly at the sufferance of the army. Now, the constant turmoil in Pakistan's political condition since independence had, the, interestingly, the same effect as India's uh, struggle with national unity. It centralized. So centrism became the dominant uh, political and economic condition of Pakistan. Uh, as, just as India had fought the, with the same tools, so did Pakistan, but for different reasons. And, of course, the results were the same, economic and political stagnation. Now, moving now to more modern times, in 1998, India, followed by Pakistan, uh, tested a uh, nuclear weapon. Of course, India had done its test in 1974 earlier, based on which the Nuclear Suppliers Group had been formed, to which, interestingly, now India is about to get, in a way, access. Now, the advantage of, as far as Pakistan was concerned, 1998, I believe, was very significant. It removed the threat of further dismemberment from India. This is a very interesting thing because when I give talk about this in India, there's a lot of puzzlement. You know, they say dismember Pakistan, that was never our goal. So I know persons from India find such a statement difficult to accept that uh, Pakistan should have this threat or this feeling of, of dismemberment from India that may happen any time. But one needs to understand Pakistan's insecurities, particularly after 1971. And Operations Brass Stacks in 1984, for those who follow that, did not help at all to get a sense of how real this threat is for them. And so until 1998, Pakistan's strategic culture was dominated by the India threat. And its, yard, and its, and its reactions can be judged almost entirely and, and by this yardstick and explained very well by it. Its consistent support for US initiatives in the region up to 1998, regardless of how callous the US seemed to be in the interim, whether it be 1971 Bangladesh or after the end of the first Afghan initiative ended in 1988 are explained by this. Post-1998, however, its external borders now secure. Pakistan was willing to ignore the US as much as the US continued to ignore it. An example was the 1999 Kargil conflict. But that conflict also showed Pakistan that the US's strategy towards Pakistan had not changed. And therefore, it continued with what it was doing as a sort of a quasi-pariah state in the international order, uh, confronting India, particularly on Kashmir, through supporting the Kashmir insurgency through men and weapons and so on. Now, as we have argued up to 1989, now I want to come back to sort of one of the puzzles I raised earlier about how the largest democracy in the world has now changed its tone towards uh, the U.S., so up to 1989, Indian interests were driven purely by centrism as a means to manage economic and political problems. And as the U.S. learned from the Eisenhower and Kennedy experiences, uh, 
there was little interest among pol Indian policymakers for collaboration with the U.S. In particular, Indian democracy had absolutely no strategic implications for fellow Democrats across the globe. Instead, other fellow centrists, and there were plenty in the non-aligned world as well as the USSR, offered more to learn from for India's big problems of underdevelopment and disintegration. The things that US Democrats stood for at the time, and not at the earlier era where there may have been more resonance, the things that they stood for at the time, civic rights such as freedom of speech and the market economy went unappreciated in India, whereas the Indian concerns, unity of the country, poverty in areas where the market economy did not reach, such as rural, rural areas, and civic harmony were little understood in the US. The US could still have had influence over India if it could have helped resolve India's external threats. But after the Indochina war ended, the only external threat that India was worried about was Pakistan, particularly over Kashmir. And this is where their strategic cultures clashed, the Indian culture on Kashmir being to seek control over the internal politics of Kashmir from New Delhi, especially after the 1952 Delhi Agreement failed, whereas the US preferred a more overt posture of mediation. However, even this became irrelevant after the Bangladesh War of 1971, which effectively ended Pakistan's military challenge to India. So in summary, from the mid-1960s to 1998, the US and India ignored each other at the geopolitical level, even as from the mid-1990s onwards, dramatic changes in India's political and economic climate led to an increase in US corporate involvement in India. Now, 9-11, coming to some more recent times, was important to, for India and Pakistan in different ways. For Pakistan, it raised the possibility of the external threat rising once more. This time, not from the erstwhile threat India, but from the US and potentially an Indo-US alliance. This was obviously not a threat that Pakistan's nuclear capability could manage. So Pakistan decided to join the US war on terror despite um, opposition at home. But at a price, you know, responding to the US offer to join its alliance on the global war on terror essentially has forced Pakistan to put its ambitions for a resolution on the Kashmir problem on hold. Essentially, Pakistan has agreed without saying so that its role in Kashmir is going to become less and less over time. And that's part of being part of the US uh, global war on terror. Now, interestingly, this has not hurt the peace process because India's incentives have changed. Okay, for India, economic growth has led its policymakers to ask what, it, what will it take now for India to become a member of the global elite. You know, whereas earlier the question was, how do, as Manmohan Singh once put it, how do we not enter the 21st century as the poorest nation on earth? The question now is quite different. And solving the Kashmir issue has therefore become a priority because no nation can be termed great if it cannot manage its own borders. So too are international relations more important, primarily at this stage for purposes of ensuring energy security. The problem was, could India trust the US? Historically, it had found that it could not. And therefore, it has taken a period of, and I think the US now realizes this, of several actions by the US which constantly reassure and build up the trust within India that the US is a reliable partner. You know, from here we often take it for granted that the US is a reliable partner, but that's certainly not the Indian perception. So for India, 9-11 was initially confirmation of the US still towards Pakistan after a short period of neutrality. So it was not until 2002, when India and Pakistan almost went to a nuclear war, that the US and the US played an important role in resolving the crisis, that India saw US interests as aligned with its own domestic interests. In this case of creating an environment that would not disturb its economic growth prospects. The more recent uh, accord, the US interest in resolving India's nuclear fuel problems provides another such situation, whatever the US motives might be, but India is the one that has asked for many years for nuclear fuel for its energy needs. But since the Nuclear Suppliers Group was formed in 1975, as I pointed out in response to India's tests, it was denied fuel. And the reversal of the US stance on Indian access to, new US, to nuclear fuel, albeit with considerable risk for the US with regard to non-proliferation, is welcomed by India as a second critical piece of evidence that US-India incentives can be aligned without outside conditions. Yet looking ahead, Indian foreign policy is likely to be closely aligned to US initiatives on the war on terror, and its global economic policy will be pro-market because its domestic interests, 
decentralized political and economic maturity, and resolving the Kashmir Accord are in accord with US interests. Here yeah, I have put up uh, a table that uh, tries to explain the transition of India. And, I, and I'd be glad to sort of speculate. I haven't thought, been able to uh, talk too much about Pakistan today, but certainly can discuss it if you're interested. So on the second and third column, describe the economically weak state and an economically stable state. And then the rows uh, a political stability, then you have political stability due to internal threats, and then political instability caused by perceptions of external threats. So here when I talk of political stability, that refers to stability of politics within the country, but its source could be internal threats, its source could be external threats. If you look at the first cell, that is where you have an economically weak state and political stability, uh, the response, uh, I argue, is internal nationalism. When I say internal nationalism, I mean the kind of nationalism which is directed towards nation building, so sort of focusing within sort of France or that whole European movement after the Franco-Prussian War uh, uh, to, to, folk, to create these nation states based on ethnicity and to focus attention on economic and uh, growth and political maturity. And India uh, was like that, I would argue, certainly from 2000 onwards, but also um, between the period 1947 to 1989. Um, I'm smiling because I had sent Liesl a slightly amended uh, table and promised her I would bug her till the end. And I see this as, this as an earlier version. So 1947 to 89 uh, should also come in here. And also 2000 onwards. Okay, and then sort of the, an example of economic and political stability where you, the outcome would be low nationalism. So Western Europe since 1960 would be an example of that. And where you have political instability due to internal threats. This was the period when uh, you had the first beginnings of subnationalism. That was a response to that situation of an economically weak state and, um, and internal threats causing political instability. Uh, the contrast to that would be where you have um, internal threats um, for various reasons, for example, civil rights issues. And then you tend to respond through civil society. So that comes over here, different developed countries at different points in time. And final row is political instability caused by perceptions of external threats. And there you have an external nationalist, sort of an aggressive type that you might see. For example, Pakistan 1947 to 1998, India, 1947 to 71, uh, would be examples of that. And of course, where you have economic stability and you have this perception of, internal, of external threats, then you have, for example, uh, Japan, Taiwan, Korea as examples of uh, internal nationalism. Now, I think the mic, oh, it's come back, yeah. So I believe this is a, a good way to understand where how India has developed. I've got some things on Pakistan. I think Pakistan right now, in a post-2000 period, really could take any of these um, any of these incarnations. You know, it could over the next few years settle in any of these uh, boxes here. You know, it it really depends on whether the army and uh, civil politicians are able to negotiate a sharing of power. If that happens, then we would see box one happening. If it doesn't happen, then I, you know, I think what will happen is that you'll have uh, the rise of subnationalisms, And then if you have economic failure and it falls well behind India and the war on terror is not resolved, then I think we will see sort of this state reverting to Pakistan, which would be sort of the, the worst possible outcome for them. But meanwhile, in India, as I pointed out, uh, you know, um, what, we, what I expect to see in terms of Indian foreign policy is a much more passive stance. And that's primarily because of its economic condition. India today is where China was in the 1980s. And often I, I, I like to look at Japan in doing, after the Meiji Restoration as a good example of where India is now. Basically, India needs to play catch up in institution building and the infrastructure for growth. As such, its foreign policy is likely to be much less aggressive than in earlier times. What implications does this have for India's regional strategy? Well, India is a large enough country that its actions have regional implications and occasionally global implications. Uh, 
So recognizing this and despite occasional talk of an aggressive stance on issues such as energy security and the need to maintain ties that were forged in the era of non-alignment with the third world and uh, in the context of the Iran gas pipeline with the Middle East and Central Asia, I believe India will focus internally and accommodate to other dominant forces on external issues, rather as China has been doing. Eviden evidence on this comes from several sources, for example, following the nuclear tests of 1998, the Indian strategy on deployment and expansion appears to be directed much more at border protection from threats by Pakistan and China than an aggressive external posture. It has, India has been willing to accommodate the US in its war on terror, including its actions against Iraq and Iran, despite overwhelming national disagreement on both stances in return for US support on, for India's economic growth. In Latin America and Africa, old ties remain dormant. In short, Indian foreign policy for the region has entered a reactive and accommodative phase. Uh, as Lee Kuan Yew recently said about China, and which appears to be applicable to India, I believe the Chinese leadership have learned. If you compete with America in armaments, you will lose. You will bankrupt yourself. So avoid it, keep your head down and smile for 40 or 50 years. So I think that's what India is also going to do, learning to smile for the next 40 or 50 years. And I believe these trends bode well uh, for the prospects for peace in uh, South Asia. So with that, I think I've spoken enough. Thank you very much. Let me end my talk here. Uh, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and have uh, welcome and invite questions and comments from the audience. Uh, I would ask that you please, uh, if you have a question, line up behind the microphone and, and uh, speak into the microphone for your question since we are being recorded in that way. Uh, your question will be captured on the, the video. And with that, I, I think, Rafiq, I'll actually let you address and the, question. the question. Okay, yeah. sure, yeah, glad to do that. Don't be shy. Yes, I think, would you like to come up? Yeah. Yeah. There has been some speculation that the Chinese will extend a, an agreement to Pakistan for nuclear fuel like um, the U.S. just has done with India. What What do you... Do you expect that, see that to be likely, and what would be the result of that? So the U.S. has agreed uh, in this agreement between President Bush and uh, Manmohan Singh, Prime Minister Singh, to, uh, to support a change in the rules of the Nuclear Suppliers Group. The Nuclear Suppliers Group is, uh, consists of 44 countries now. Initially, it was just those that, um, the five countries that had nuclear power at the time of 1974. So actually, um, neither the US nor China over, uh, can legally, under the Nuclear Suppliers Group Agreement, agree to supply nuclear fuel unless they all agree. Unless India deems, uh, and I'm surprised that, that people are very confident because China is definitely going to be a stumbling block to the NSG, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, agreeing to supply nuclear fuel to India. Uh, however much the U.S. wants it. Uh, it's possible that the U.S. will then, as we were joking earlier, form its own coalition of the willing and supply nuclear fuel on its own uh, to India. Uh, and I think China is similarly constrained with Pakistan. So I think the, it could be interesting in the sense that Pakistan might want to use its uh, relationship with China to allow the nuclear suppliers group to allow both of them to give it. But on their own, neither should do it or neither can do it under the NSG. As to whether China wants to do it and will enter into such an agreement with Pakistan, uh, um, I think it's not that obvious that they will. I think you know the AQ Khan network sort of upset them. Um, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure, although I have no evidence that they were not involved, but that the Pakistani leadership, to some extent, was involved in this, and that the U.S. knew about it fairly early in 2001. Um, but because of the need to ally with Pakistan, did not really make it an issue until it was brought out elsewhere. So those are my thoughts on it. Yeah. Yes, please. Would you like to announce your name also? Uh, my name is Richard um, I have two questions about Pakistan. Um, the first one has to do with whether you perceive uh, some benefit uh, maintaining a kind of a antagonism towards India to provide some coherence to Pakistan? Or can that 
uh, relationship be transformed so that uh, economic benefits will flow from improved relations with Pakistan uh, and India. Uh, the second one ha issue has to do with the coherence of the Pakistani uh, government, uh, the military government. As you're well aware, there are elements within the security system and so forth that have supported the Taliban and it's, and it's fairly fragile. Uh, is there a point at which or circumstances in which um, Musharraf has already been targeted once or twice, but if he were to you know, be eliminated, uh, would the Pakistani military be able to uh, take his place in effect and provide some degree of coherence, or is the Pakistani military itself fragmented and you could see a, a devolution and instability uh, generated by, the, by that? Thank you. So on your first question on whether antagonism to India provides uh, coherence to Pakistan, um, or there is some other strategy that could provide coherence to Pakistan. Um, my view is that antagonism to India provided coherence to the, to the army, uh, not to Pakistan itself, which I think was as post-1947 was uh, and certainly post-1971, uh, sees itself as a nation. Uh, I don't see it disintegrating on ethnic grounds into its various constituents, um, or indeed of religious radicalism uh, overtaking the, the country. Um, you know, our book reports on a survey, uh, several of them that have been done of uh, Pakistani attitudes towards the involvement of religion in uh, politics. And overwhelmingly, this is a very good paper by Chris Fair of the US Institute of Peace in our book. Um, overwhelmingly, there's no support for theocratic uh, politics. So the question is, uh, in my view, the real question is, is the army um, going to survive if the strategy of antagonism to India ends? Uh, there's no doubt that the army has used that, just as it's used uh, religious radicalism to uh, create uh, support for itself. And it's been unfortunate for Pakistan because, um, I, mean, I mean, historically it's, it's interesting because why didn't India go that way? I mean, the, in many ways the forces were the same. The one reason was that post-independence, um, India adopted a series of land reforms which effectively reduced the power of the feudal system. That did not happen in Pakistan. So the result was that when f and elections were held in Pakistan, then the feudal system captured the votes and came into power. And uh, being feudal in nature, they then proceeded to bankrupt the country. Um, and so the army would observe this and respond by saying, well, we're observing these uh, fairly elected, free and fair elections have taken place, but it's brought into power a group of people who don't care for the country and will certainly not be able to tackle the India threat, which, by the way, as I was saying, is, is not, it was real in their minds all the way till 1998. Um, so, how, so if this threat is real and civilians can't handle it, well, it's up to us, the army, to provide uh, the security of the country and, to, and therefore a coup would result. Uh, but the army never saw that as legitimizing itself into the long term. So always uh, army rule was, has been followed by a period in which the, um, the army ruler has tried to legitimize uh, army rule by creating a civilian superstructure around it. Uh, and that explains all these number of constitutions. So they went to extraordinary pains to legitimate themselves. And that's, I think, uh, a feature of Pakistan's somewhat higher level of uh, civil society uh, than you would find, say, in countries like Iraq, where civil society is much less developed. So, so the question is now, I think, for Pakistan, um, you have a situation where the military realizes that um, its reason for existence is pretty much disappearing because it's part of the American coalition for some years to come. And it must negotiate a sharing of power with the civilian sector. I think if it can do that, I mean, you see sporadic signs and you see, you know, two steps forward, one step back, that sort of thing. Uh, then, um, and then you have, as I was putting it, uh, oops, 
the, you know, the state of uh, focusing on internal nationalism. Otherwise, Pakistan, could, if it didn't make that choice sensibly, it could very quickly uh, disintegrate. So I think that risk uh, exists. But my sense is with, if there is progress on Kashmir and so on, independent of Pakistan's involvement, that that will push the military to make that sort of uh, an alliance with the civilian politicians. Certainly, the US should push hard in that direction. The question of whether um, if you know the, the coherence of the Pakistani government, if primarily in the context of President Musharraf uh, disappearing, I think he's, President Musharraf has done a wonderful job of convincing the West that he is indispensable. Um, I don't believe that for a moment. I have uh, spent a lot of time over the last two years visiting Pakistan on a different project on telecommunications issues, but it took me into interaction with various levels of government and the military. It was very clear to me that there are 1,000 or 10,000 Musharrafs out there. Uh, in other words, Musharraf represents the culture of Pakistan's army very accurately, and that if he goes, there will be many others behind him. But he finds it convenient to portray himself as being the bulwark or the one whose disappearance would, uh, would leave Pakistan into, take it into catastrophe. And that he's doing that because he wants to continue in power as long as he can. So I think the quicker the West is rid of that notion, the US can use whatever influence it has as part of this coalition in the war on terror to push the country towards democracy. I'm curious <clears throat> as to your assessment of the present uh, role of religious factions and conflict in the cohesions of the two uh, countries' governments or uh, their populations' uh, relationships. So what is my assessment of the role of the, the religious factions in...? <clears throat> yeah, what role does... Sometimes we have <clears throat> very uh, overt and uh, violent religious conflicts, how does that play into the uh, <clears throat> coherence and viability of the two right. governments? Um, well, it's a question of whether these things will happen, you know, religious outbreaks will, religiously influenced, uh, I would say it's not religion, but it's political religion, so an attempt to gain uh, theocratic legitimacy um, is whether these things will happen, one, and second is, if they happen, can the state absorb it without changing its course? Um, and I would add my answer to the first question is yes, they will happen. Um, and the reason they will happen is primarily poverty. So it's, it's relatively easy, relatively inexpensive uh, to create uh, an environment where people feel discriminated against and win elections on that basis. Um, at the state level, certainly, if not at the center, I think India is becoming much more mature in that respect. Whether the system can absorb it, um, the second question, I think certainly India with its much more mature um, democracy, although still weak civil society, uh, relative to what it should be, and relative to its stage of political development, India is an awfully weak civil society. Um, but still, I think India can absorb it. Um, uh, whether Pakistan can absorb it um, is a much more difficult question. Um, but the reason for religious violence is much less in Pakistan than in India. India is a much more heterogeneous um, body, you know, in the people of different faiths, geographies, and so on. And, uh, and if there is a reason in Pakistan, it mostly has to do with Kashmir. So I would put that as being sort of the risk question mark. If that improves, then I see that environment uh, settling down in Pakistan as well. If it does not, it, you know, the risk remains significant. And the ability of the Pakistan state to absorb it is certainly less. Lieutenant Colonel Mark Harish, you stated that the uh, Pakistanis no longer perceive an external threat as of 1998. Is that due solely due to the uh, nuclear testing and the overt possession of nuclear weapons, or are there other factors as well? Um, so, yes, it was primarily that because of its nuclear armaments, uh, they no longer perceive the um, an ex a dismemberment from India. Now, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be a war between the two. I talked in 2002, late 2002, that almost happened. 
and I, you know, I've read about policy makers on both sides sort of calculating, you know, Bombay, we can get rid of Bombay, Calcutta, Delhi, and, but in return, we'll crush the whole of Pakistan, you know, and calculations like that, which uh, to an academic, absolutely appalling, you know. Um, but they were doing these things somewhat cold-heartedly. So I think, the, 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 yes, they do, particularly after 2002, when India withdrew its troops from the borders, about half a million were mobilized primarily around Kashmir. That seemed to prove to Pakistan that its nuclear weaponry, combined, of course, with the American involvement uh, in the war on terror, I mean, America played a big positive role in diffusing that crisis, had finally made it secure, uh, at least from India. Not, not necessarily from an Indo-US global alliance, you know, on the war on terror, but certainly from India. Raj Mohan Gandhi, Program in South Asian Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, two questions, one a narrower one. Um, what significance do you attach to the present unrest, apparently, in Balochistan, and the, which has been met uh, with considerable use of force, including bombings? Uh, impact on the tribes uh, between the Northwest Frontier and Afghanistan as a result of action prodded by America against militants believed to be hiding there. Uh, that's the narrower question. The broader question is this. Um, if uh, opinion in Pakistan <coughs> regards the uh, treatment of, the, of uh, the agreement between the US and India on the nuclear issue as one more instance of some kind of discrimination in favor of non-Muslims as against Muslims, or non-Muslim countries as against Muslim countries, one kind of rule for India, another kind of rule for uh, Iran. Uh, I don't know whether you saw, but the Australian Prime Minister is in India now, and uh, there are talks for the purchase of uranium from Australia by India, and there is some suggestion that these talks may, may be successful. Uh, even if some may hold that this um, preference for India is to do with India's stability and India's democracy rather than India not being a Muslim country, will the perception of double standards uh, have an impact, significant impact in Pakistan or not? Um, it, I think it's a good question. I mean, it well could. Um, I think from Pakistan's point of view, uh, there was an interesting comment in the Dawn newspaper yesterday, uh, which said that the U.S. is uh, involved with Pakistan because Pakistan worries it, and the U.S. involved with India because India interests it. Um, and I think that seems to be the perception within Pakistan. I think it ac accurately captures what um, policymakers in Pakistan feel about what the U.S. is doing jointly with India. Uh, in return, I think they will look for actions um, that help Pakistan. I think they realize that they are not a strategic ally of the US in the way that the US wants India to be, but a tactical ally. Um, I, I, they're not happy with that. They don't accept it, and uh, they don't willingly accept it. But at this point, they have no choice. So I think Pakistan, as I pointed out earlier, is in a situation where the policymakers feel quite bottled in by the moves that um, uh, that U.S. and India have uh, undertaken. Whether now in that context, the, whether the what significance does uh, the the unrest in Balochistan or earlier, uh, you know, the protests by tribes in the northwest frontier province area? I mean, these make up a very small percentage of the population, as you know. Together, uh, the northwest frontier province areas. Uh, Baluchistan together make up uh, less than 15% of uh, Pakistan's population. And, the, the, you know, I think their motives are certainly influenced by the, the common uh, ethnicity that is shared with Afghanistan. So I'm not surprised uh, at their reaction, especially given that the Pakistani army has been quite uh, strong uh, in acting in those areas. Um, so I, I'm not surprised by that reaction at all. In fact, even if you look at where the uh, Pakistan, uh, where in the, in the elections that were held in 2002, 
where did the religious parties win their most seats? It was not in Karachi, which was considered sort of the epicenter of extremism and terrorism in Pakistan. It was one in these areas, in Balochistan and Northwest Frontier Province. And in the past, those areas have never resonated with religious politics at all. In fact, they've been the most anti-religion in their political stance. And the religious parties' vote has always come from um, pockets in Sindh. So it's very interesting that this reversal took place and they got up to something like 11% of the vote and 15% of the seats. So one approach is to say that that's something that doesn't reflect the rest of the country and could have no significant implications for uh, the stability of Pakistan. And the other is to say, well, it's, it's a sign of what the whole country feels. Uh, perhaps my preference is more for the former interpretation. Tom Carter, you've mentioned uh, several times a resolution to the Kashmiri problem. Um, what do you see as a realistic resolution there that that Pakistan will back down, or what what, what do you see as a, a realistic resolution right. that will solve the problem? So there is uh, one third of Kashmir is. Uh, controlled by Pakistan, so we can call that Pakistan Kashmir, and then two-thirds, including the Kashmir Valley, is with India, so Indian Kashmir. Now, Indian Kashmir is where the concept of Kashmiri culture uh, uh, has, or the Kashmiriyat that I mentioned earlier, which has led to the problem, has been most significant. Actually, the portions that are with Pakistan have a fairly close affinity with Punjab. You know, some parts of it, of course, are parts of Kashmir. I mean, it's not discontinuous like that, but a good proportion, for example, Mir or the Pooch area are uh, very Punjab dominated. So a resolution would have to happen within the Kashmir Valley, that is what is in India. And if you look at the population overall of Jammu and Kashmir, including the Tibetan and the Ladakh areas, it's about 77% uh, Muslim. Now a resolution um, could happen in many ways. One question to ask is what do the Kashmir Kashmiri people want. And my sense is that what they want is neither to ally with India or Pakistan, but to be independent. So that is their desire. They're not going to get it, of course. Uh, what India would want is to keep Kashmir as part of India. Um, and, but they recognize that if a, if a vote was held today, that that would not be the outcome of the vote. The Kashmiri people would not vote uh, to stay with India. Pakistan would like Kashmir to vote to join uh, Pakistan. Um, but you know, my view is that that would be the second choice. Uh, and staying with India might be the third, to independence being the first. Now, what is reasonable or realistic and which should be accepted by both sides is um, a, a slow process towards more autonomy. So the 1952 Delhi Agreement, which was signed between Sheikh Abdullah, then you know, who became uh, Chief Minister, well, actually Prime Minister of Kashmir. It has its own constitution even now. And uh, the Prime Minister of India, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, um, that sort of set out the parameters of, what, or, or, of autonomy that was acceptable to Kashmir at that time. You know, it would have its own constitution. Um, foreign policy would be vested with New Delhi. Uh, currency would be with New Delhi, communications would be with New Delhi, uh, but it would have its own constitution, land rights, uh, for example, non-Kashmiris could not buy land in, in Kashmir, uh, rules that exist even to this day. So, but uh, the question of political autonomy was chipped away at as part of Mrs. Ga Nehru's and Mrs. Gandhi's centralist, centralizing policy. So a return to the Kashmir agreement would I think be immediately acceptable to, India, to Indian Kashmir as well as to New Delhi, to Srinagar and New Delhi. I think that's the first step. The second is to build ties between both sides of Kashmir, and that's already begun. So I think that's, that's the way forward, you know, and the idea should be, I mean, I think India should even be willing to give a commitment that, say, 25 years later, we agree to have a, a plebiscite in Kashmir. And the hope is that in 25 years, India would have progressed to the level where Kashmir, Indian Kashmir would want to stay as part of India. And long term, I mean, I think 
the concept of borders, you know, I think European Union has shown how to do it. I mean, that's, that's another possible solution as well. So I think there are various options. I think really the most important thing is to have a pathway that everyone agrees to, even if the, the end in sight is not clear. Hi, Rafiq. Uh, my name is Zad Raja. And uh, I'm actually going to sort of continue on, on, on the point you just uh, sort of began there, which is um, my question really is, where do you see India and Pakistan being 25 years from today? Um, in the political sense, of course, uh, we hope that there's you know, more peaceful climate and uh, that there's economic development that takes both countries forward. Um, but where do you see in the context of the current situation and in the context of your talk today, uh, the two countries being in about a quarter of a century hmm. from now? I think India's destiny is much clearer. You know, it's, it's on the path to economic growth. I mean, it has severe problems in, in terms of its divide between have and have nots, and that showed up in the 2004 elections. Uh, so those are challenges that it has to manage, whether it will be able to do it or not, certainly we don't know today, but I think there is a decent chance, uh, especially with federalized politics. I mean, certainly the work I've been doing in the rural areas on communication technologies convinces me that very bold, innovative moves with dramatic implications are happening there. Pakistan destiny, as I tried to point out, really depends a lot on the ability of uh, the army to negotiate power sharing with uh, civilian politicians. If it cannot do that, then I think its destiny is, is downward and could lead to confrontation. If it can do that, I think its destiny is to look to progressing along with the rest of South Asia. Uh, you know, in that, that context, um, US policy needs to be much more clear. Currently, US policy seems to be that India is our South Asia partner, and Pakistan's role is to help us manage our relations with uh, the, the Middle East and Central Asia. And uh, I heard this articulated not just once, but several times in a conference that I spoke at at the Woodrow Wilson Center a few weeks ago in Washington, DC. And I said, that's certainly not what the Pakistanis see themselves as, as being a, so the US's handmaiden for managing energy supplies into Tajikistan, for example. And so if the US is not clear about Pakistan's South Asian destiny, which is how they see themselves, uh, I think we could have problems. Um, Essen Rizvi. Um, my question is, what is the U.S. getting out of the India, like giving civil nuclear technology to India? And, I mean, people say it's the economic benefit, of, but economics has its own role to play. It doesn't really need countries coming into a compact with each other. So that's my question. So there's a big move in the U.S., as you know, to open up the nuclear power development in this country as well. And this feeds nicely into that. So there's certainly certain domestic corporate interests pushing it, um, and some would argue that those dominate foreign policy. I don't know. Uh, but I think the other part is the US is hoping uh, that uh, you know, its long-term, you can say, control over the wealth of Asia through Japan and Korea uh, and Taiwan, which is going to be challenged by China's rise, is, is the issue for them. That over the next 30 or 40 years, uh, you will arguably see a very strong China uh, whose, uh, whose political interests in terms of how it builds its relations, even its supply chains, are not going to be influenced by U.S. policy. And that concerns the U.S. And I think India is one way to manage that. I think that's uh, probably a mistaken policy, uh, in my opinion. I don't think India is ready to play that role, you, you know, as I was telling uh, mentioning this morning, the, the surest way to empty out a room of Indian policymakers to tell them that they have to confront China. You know, that's the last thing they're interested in. There's an enormous reservoir of goodwill towards China in India and vice versa. I'm well aware of that. So, so I think, you know, the, the U.S. is thinking that way and thinking fairly long term in that respect. And I don't buy it, you know, I think it's a mistake. But at the same time, I think this nuclear fuel deal is a good one. It's certainly much better for India than for the US. <laughs>
All right, any further questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, uh, if no further questions, then let's thank again um, the Center for Advanced Study and the various co-sponsoring units and, of course, uh, Dr. Rafiq Dosani.